Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to APE's video notes for topic 6.7, which is energy from biomass. So our objective for today is to be able to describe the environmental effects of using biomass as an energy source. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is describing responses or solutions to an environmental issue. So the first thing we'll talk about today is biomass versus biofuels. So biomass is just basically any organic matter. This could be wood, charcoal, dried animal waste, or just dry you know, brush or grass that is going to be burned. And it's usually going to be to heat a home or to cook food over. Um, so one thing I wanna point out here is that this is primarily used in developing nations. This is because it's easy to harvest. It's also going to be oftentimes free or very inexpensive. So it's used as a subsistence food. Remember that means uh, just getting by essentially, just meeting your basic needs. So we can see a picture here of someone, uh, presumably in the developed world or in the developing world, gathering what looks like you know some dried palm trees to take home and again, probably burn to either heat their home or to cook their meals over. It can be used to generate electricity, but this is pretty rare. Um, there was sort of a biomass uh, push for generating electricity a while back when it was thought to be more environmentally sustainable, uh, but it's not used as often as fossil fuels because it's just so much less energy dense and it's kind of you know time intensive to gather all that biomass compared to mining coal or oil. So we can see a diagram here of basically this idea that you can just kind of chip up your wood or grind it into small pellets and then feed it into a fire that's going to you know turn water into steam and produce electricity just in the same way as if we burn fossil fuels but it's not really widely used um, so that's just something to be aware of then we'll talk about now uh, biofuels so biofuels are going to be liquid fuels uh, such as ethanol or biodiesel and these are created primarily from biomass such as corn uh, sugarcane or palm plants and so typically we plant these and then harvest them to convert them again into a liquid fuel this is primarily because we rely so heavily on gasoline as our liquid fuel for transportation. And so it's a great either replacement or sort of supplement to liquid fuels like gasoline. And next we'll talk about the idea of modern versus fossil carbon. So it's important to note that burning biomass does release carbon dioxide, but it doesn't increase atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in the same way that burning fossil fuels does. So this is because when we burn biomass, we're releasing what we refer to as modern carbon. What this means is that this is carbon that was recently in the atmosphere in the form of CO2, and it was recently taken into a plant via photosynthesis. Whereas when we burn fossil fuels, we are releasing fossil carbon. So this is carbon that was basically stored underground and out of circulation for millions of years. So we are essentially effectively adding new carbon to the atmosphere that was not previously in circulation. So burning biomass is something that we consider carbon neutral. And again, it's not a perfect wash. It's not a perfectly you know, carbon neutral activity, but overall it's not going to increase uh, atmospheric carbon levels in the same way that burning fossil fuels does. Another way to think of this is spending a dollar that you just found, uh, kind of easy come, easy go. It doesn't really change your net worth, but if you're starting to pull a lot of money out of your life savings and spending that money, you are decreasing your life savings. You're decreasing your net worth. And so again, think of it as spending a long-term savings dollar versus a dollar that you just found on the ground. Uh, if we look at this diagram here, we can understand a little bit better how this works. So we have the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is taken in by a tree. Then when it's burned, it turns that carbon dioxide, uh, releases it back in the atmosphere. And so it's a relatively balanced cycle. But when we burn fossil fuels, we're burning carbon uh, that had been out of circulation under the ground you know, for millions of years and adding essentially what we would consider new carbon back into the atmosphere. Next, we'll talk about some of the environmental and the human health consequences of biomass burning. So one thing that we should know is when biomass is burned, it releases carbon monoxide, NOx, particulate matter, and volatile organic compounds or VOX. These are all respiratory irritants to humans. So this is a big cause of respiratory irritation and respiratory disease globally. Overall, about 3 billion people around the world cook the majority of their meals on open biomass fires. And so again, when this is done indoors, this is going to basically exacerbate or make the problem worse. When you're burning a fire indoors for heat or for cooking, the pollutants are trapped and they're not allowed to be dispersed as easily. And so this is going to worsen asthma, worsen bronchitis, COPD, emphysema, it's gonna irritate the eyes. So we can see a picture here of a woman, again, cooking food here, 
in a relatively closed space. And so all of those pollutants that are produced are going to be trapped in that house and they're going to be building up in higher concentrations and they could lead to respiratory problems for both this woman and her small child. So when we talk about environmental consequences, we should know that biomass burning uh, leads to deforestation and the release of specific air pollutants. Remember, really making an effort here to emphasize air pollutants and not air pollution. Air pollution is a vague uh, kind of fluffy eco jargon term. Air pollutants are specific compounds that are released. So one reason that this occurs so much in developing nations is a lack of environmental protection laws or the enforcement of those laws. Um, and even more so the lack of the sort of financial resources to be able to afford other fuels besides for subsistence fuels. And so both of these things contribute to deforestation for energy use in developing nations. It also is gonna to lead to habitat loss as we are cutting down trees and removing forest ecosystems. It's going to lead to soil erosion as there are fewer roots in the ground to stabilize the soil. It's going to decrease the ability of forests to take in carbon and sequester it through photosynthesis. And then finally, we're also going to have the release of specific air pollutants. In this case, NOx or nitrogen oxides, uh, VOX, volatile organic compounds, and particulate matter. And it's important to, know, uh, important to point out that from an environmental standpoint, these are all contributors to the formation of smog. So that can decrease sunlight, uh, it can lower the rate of photosynthesis. And we'll talk more about smog in depth in unit seven. Next, we'll take a look at biofuels, which again are liquid fuels, uh, primarily from corn uh, and, and in some cases algae. So in this uh, example here, we have corn and sugarcane, which will be fermented into ethanol, which can then be mixed with gasoline. And so the basic process is that corn and sugarcane are harvested. They are broken down or ground up uh, to break down some of the cellulose and make their sugars more available. And then yeast is added to the sugar mixture. And that's going to enable the yeast through the process of fermentation to convert that sugar into ethanol. And so if we take a look at a diagram here, again, what we can see is that we have the collection of the corn. It's going to be milled or broken down. And that's because cellulose is very hard to digest. And so if it's broken down mechanically first, the yeast are able to access those sugars. So the sugars are kind of concentrated and then the yeast are added. So there's fermentation and then distillation to, distillation to separate out particularly the ethanol, which is valuable. And that can be transported and mixed with gasoline to basically lower the amount of petroleum we need for transportation. And so it's important to point out though, that this is typically not used by itself. So typically ethanol will be mixed with gasoline in a mixture called E85 or flex fuel. So this is about 51 to 83% ethanol with the rest of the mixture being made up by gasoline. And it can only be used in flex fuel vehicles. So that's important to point out. Uh, it does decrease the oil consumption needed for transportation, but since ethanol is less energy dense than petroleum, you need more ethanol or more E85 to get the same distance out of your vehicle. We should be aware here that while this may seem renewable, and it is renewable by definition, by the fact that corn can be replanted and sugarcane can be replanted over and over and over again, uh, so it is technically renewable, but it's only as sustainable as your agriculture to produce that corn and to produce that sugar cane is. So if you're degrading your soil uh, through intensive tilling and through fertilizer use, uh, it's not going to be sustainable long term. And so just very important that we point that out. It is renewable uh, by the textbook definition, but it is not necessarily sustainable if your monocropping or your uh, agricultural methods are not sustainable. Uh, so we should be aware of environmental consequences that come with ethanol production. And these are basically all of the consequences from unit five, where we covered consequences of big agriculture. Uh, and so these would be things like soil erosion, habitat loss as we clear land to plant the corn, the release of greenhouse gases from the soil and from the machinery used, as well as from the fertilizers that are applied to the fields, and of course, uh, water consumption. Uh, one thing to point out is that a lot of corn is needed to generate ethanol uh, enough to be used for transportation. So that can compete potentially with human or animal consumption of corn. So it may impact corn prices in the US, that could be an issue. Now, one way that we can produce ethanol a little more sustainably is through algae. So algae are actually able to be uh, grown, cultivated, and then harvested 
and the algae can be basically uh, dried out and you can do fermentation with algae to produce a bioethanol similar to the way that we do it with corn, but it can also have oils that are extracted and those oils can be turned into a biodiesel. So it's important that we know that algae is uh, a potentially more sustainable option for producing biofuels or biodiesel. And finally, we'll wrap up today by looking at biodiesel. So this is gonna be different than biofuels. Biodiesels are still liquid fuels, uh, but they're produced specifically from plant oils. So there's no fermentation, there's no ethanol being produced. It is the oil from the plant that can be burned as a fuel source. And so the most popular form of biodiesel comes from palm plants. And so these are typically grown in tropical climates, uh, but it's important to point out that some recent studies have concluded that palm biodiesel actually produces 98% more, so almost double the greenhouse gas emissions compared to equivalent energy production through fossil fuels. And this is due primarily to the fact that you have to clear land, oftentimes tropical forest, uh, for the palm plantations. So if we look at this graph here, we can see that over time, the share of the total contribution to global climate change of palm uh, has risen over the years as it's become more popular to basically generate this alternative or seemingly renewable uh, fuel source. And so again, we should point out it is technically renewable by this idea that we can continually plant palm trees uh, and we can't continually get more and more fossil fuels, but it's not necessarily sustainable if the underlying agricultural methods are not sustainable. So it can be more sustainable if we're using land that's already been cleared or land that is not uh, productive in a forest ecosystem already, or if you reuse plantations over and over and over again, then you can bring down the greenhouse gas emissions sort of per unit of energy. Um, but again, with all biofuels, I wanna point out that they are only as sustainable as the agricultural methods that underlie them. And then if we take a look at this picture here, it can just kind of remind us of some of those environmental consequences that can come with producing energy through biodiesel. So we have carbon dioxide release as forest is cleared and can no longer sequester carbon in the future and also decay releases some of the carbon stored in those trees. We have loss of habitat, of course. Uh, there's going to be soil erosion when you clear land. And then finally, we lose the ecosystem service provided by those trees, which is you know, loss of air and water purification. So for practice FRQ 6.7 today, our skill is describing a potential response or approach to an environmental problem. So the first thing I want you to do is explain why biodiesel fuels have a different effect on atmospheric carbon levels than fossil fuels do. And then also to describe two environmental benefits of using algae for biofuel production rather than corn or palm oil or sugarcane. 